talking all things theatre and events. I've been a professional dancer now for 18 years and I've, a lot of my main work is with Matthew Bourne's New Adventures. I mean, I think everyone listening or, or, or anyone involved in the arts will understand that that's our purpose, it, it is the arts. Just a bit of a summer hobby, decided to see if we could start a venue. The Stage Is Yours podcast. Hello and welcome back to The Stage Is Yours podcast with me, your host, Cal Graham, joined as always by producer Dan, and we're talking all things theatre and events. Joining us on the podcast today is James McKenzie, owner and director of Zoo Venues. We talk all things Zoo, from their shows and their unique challenges to Zoo's latest venture, Zoo TV, and how they go about offering shows during a global pandemic. James McKenzie, The Stage Is Yours. Join us down the podcast. We've got James McKenzie, uh, owner, director of Zoo Venues. Um, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good hand. I'm I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, so let's start off with a little bit about yourself, kind of what you do with Zoo Venues, what you do outside of Zoo Venues, and yeah, a few things like that. Uh, okay, so um, I originally trained as a lighting designer, so I guess that was kind of my first uh, career. Uh, still is partially my career um but alongside that almost at an identical time as, as studying for my degree um I'd obviously been to Edinburgh as a student to the festival um like a lot of people uh and uh one of the things that really sparked my interest was was venues and and particularly in those days so going back like 25 years or whatever it was there were some venues uh some really great venues and some really terrible venues um and I was just kind of intrigued by what a venue could be. So me and some mates very much as a kind of, uh, just a bit of a summer hobby, decided to see if we could start a venue. And um, so we just hired a room, little room with maybe, I think we had five shows in the first year. Uh, And it was just a little trial and we managed to not lose too much money. we, we lost a little bit of money and, and I had to go to the bank and ask them for a, for a, a loan. But I, I did slightly lie and tell them I was buying a car, which everyone thought was hysterical because I couldn't drive at the time. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so we kind of just got through the first year and it, it just kind of went from there, really. So it's been like I, I, it's like a sort of twin uh, career of, of um, running Zoo, uh, which is obviously just gone from being that one little room to kind of a multi-venue space and with a real identity to also lighting shows and working on big festivals as production manager and that kind of thing um lots of different things really never never settled on one thing never settled on one I, I know that feeling I could never quite make my mind up as to if I had to choose one what would it be and I'm like I quite like that I jump around and do that have different hats as it were and do different things at different times no that's grand so let's talk a little bit more about uh overall of what zoo is and things like obviously you touched on there that you're a venue uh provider uh at the edinburgh festival fringe um so let's talk a little about zoo's identity and kind of what for you zoo is and what you kind of it really is you're trying to showcase at zoo yeah i it, it sounds um slightly uh what's the word I'm looking for slightly holier than thou to say this now but it genuinely is the truth that at the time we started we we were chatting to a lot of shows that went and they they are a lot of them felt that their venues were like uh someone described it to me as as just a factory and they felt that as shows they just came in and they did their bit and they were kicked out the door again and then the next lot were in and we we just figured that you could do venues a little bit differently and kind of try to base it around what the artists actually need uh, and what they want. And I guess it's, it wasn't like an over the night, you know, we didn't write a manifesto and follow it. But I think what we've, what we've always tried to do is keep the artists as the important bit in the venue. And it's, and it's them that we're really interested in. And it's presenting their work in a way that um, is good uh, and, and fully reflects their work um, has always been the sort of overriding thing. And alongside that, and I think this probably because of my technical background, we, I felt that a lot of shows 
you know, come to Edinburgh to sell their work on to other places. And they can't do that if they can't technically present their work as it should be seen, because you're selling a, a, a half-baked idea, a, a half-baked version of what your show should be. And so I think um, we kind of have this desire to try and see if we could, in a fringe setting, allow shows to present their work as it's meant to be seen. Uh, and it is tricky. It's, I mean, we don't always achieve it, but it, it's quite a it's quite a fun mental challenge and a bit of a you know to try and do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's obviously that essence of the fringes you go to is the theatre is in a place that was never meant to be a theatre to start with. So there's not so there's the inherent challenges just initially of making the space even turn into a theatre in the first place. Let alone then go, yep. Yeah, you can just bring or do exactly what you want or that you've been doing wherever you've done before in this space that if you walk into it any other time of the year is completely different and hasn't you probably wouldn't look at it and go oh yeah that'll be a theater in for 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 a month every year and yeah. do that i mean i mean you'll cert i've certainly seen a couple of shows at zoo that you take stuff on that well yeah apps i don't know it anywhere else that might do maybe underbelly circus hub just because they create it all themselves from the ground but um i mean stay i think it's called stage that i saw in 2019 yeah. that <laughs> yeah uh for the first half an hour is a giant swing <laughs> i think but it is it's interesting isn't it because i think it's just that thing it's how do you I, I enjoy that mental challenge of how do you balance the needs of all of those shows that you've got in a program and how do you give them all a chance to show what they can do? Yeah. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's a good challenge. It's a, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice thing to do. And it's, um, and it, it's sort of a, and take, and also attracting shows that wouldn't normally come, you know, like shows would just say, Oh, the fringe isn't for me because we're too big or we're too complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess it's just it's I mean I think I guess that's it it's always been the challenge and that's kind of what motivates us and and probably motivates me to keep wanting to come back yeah because it's never the same every year I think it's like you said you if you're putting on I mean eight ten thirteen different shows a day in the same space it's well yeah it's creating that space that works for every single one of those shows without having to completely tear it apart in between each one and make each one work and that flow between each one so that every show happens as it's supposed to but also makes your life's not a million times stressful having to complete it around so it's kind of that mesh of all these shows come together to make yeah. it work and it's it's just I think once you've got a team together like you know I'm really really lucky I've got this like amazing team who are just like uh, but we always we have this sort of mantra, which is like the, your first response to a question should be yes, not no. And, and, and then you might have to say no later on. But like if you're always trying to say yes, that means you're pushing yourself to do the to try and, you know, do whatever crazy idea it might be. And sometimes that's led to us. We did once have to crane a trampoline in through a first floor window at like 3 a.m., which was just possibly a step too far thinking about it now at the time it felt like a good idea but <laughs> <laughs> yeah it felt like a good idea and then at 3 a.m when you're doing it you'll go yeah okay maybe this was a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah i think we've all been there and had those moments where you're seeing something happen and you go yeah maybe not maybe not what or it doesn't quite happen as you planned but yeah always yeah never a straight no just always or yes let's figure it out and you go around the all around the houses coming up with these always out of the box solutions because i think at the festival yeah. you get asked you just face challenges that you're never going to face anywhere else because there's not a straightforward convention of this is how every space works there's not a straight loading dock it can be the most awkward place to access ever it can be the room can be absolutely great, but in Edinburgh, it can be on the second floor on one side of the building, the first on another, and it's a spiral staircase to get to. And it's some grade two listed building that's got ancient artwork or whatever on the walls and stuff like that, that you've got to avoid and not cause any damage or anything to. So I think, yeah, it's all, I think that, like you said, it's the challenge of it that 
every year it brings a completely different set of challenges because it's a completely new set of shows which yeah and it's it's and it the fun bit is working with those companies as well so like the really good times are when you you get a company who kind of a, who totally acknowledge those challenges who also want to work with you to come up yeah. with a solution so you know the ones who like rebuild their set so it comes apart in the middle or you know will yeah. say to you okay fine yeah let's do a you know, Scottish dance there when I once did a, a crazy show where uh, the fastest they'd ever built their set was four and a half hours. <laughs> and we had to do it in an hour. hour. So it was yeah. that thing of like, oh, let's have, you know, 3 a.m. Uh, rehearsals of getting the set in. Yeah. With like, like yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. And I think those bits are like, those bits are really fun. And they, and it's weird for me because obviously like I program the show. So I kind of like, I, I, I can, I think, I think if you're not technical when you're programming shows, it's quite easy to program a show and then like hand over to your production manager and go, there you go. Secret. And like with, with little guilt, the problem is that I know when I'm saying yes, that the looks on my production team's face, is gonna think, <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, I'm, I maybe shouldn't say yes to this because I'm then going to like hand over to them and then they're just going to look at me and go, you, you've done what now? <laughs> Yeah, and just the stream of responses going, well, okay, yeah. But I also love that thing of you get that initial response of going, okay, you're asking me to do what? To, okay, here's just tra- chains of emails, plans, drawings, sketches, whatever it is. And then you see it at the end and you go, yeah, actually, well, not the what was I worried about, but we've made it work it's happened it's done it's dusted and then obviously there's the added challenge with the festival as well that these people could be coming from anywhere in the world whether that's australia and anything like that. so there's all the kind of trying to make all that work and we had a company from australia who literally had never met any of us or done anything before coming to us and just went okay we just trust you to make it happen and that it's all going to be there and it's done and it works out and you just see that kind of massive train of stuff and the, yeah there is a trust element from the companies in us to make it happen but that's just kind of where you're like yeah we can do it and you just see hundreds of emails or and they're always at stupid o'clock in the morning you always have that brainwave but yeah when you're not thinking about it and you go ah light bulb yes let's that's how we're gonna do it and it's even more fun when you when you when you're working in different languages as well when you you know we do a lot of work with Czech companies and you and like obviously they, they're amazing and speak really great English and you rubbish and speak very little Czech <laughs> but there are times I really wish that, I, <laughs> that I'd understood and even it's it's the cultural differences and the tone and you know we learned I, one of the lessons I learned really early was that um, an email that is in someone's second language might sound quite aggressive and quite blunt mm. but it's simply that they can't, they can't add that nuance because, you know, although their English is like astonishing. Grammatically perfect. Grammatically Most perfect, <laughs> but it can sound quite, yeah. you think, oh, they're, they're really angry about this. And then when you chat to them, they're not angry at all, but you've just mi- you've, you've misread the email. So I think it's a real, um, it's, yeah, it kind of wants you, it's something you have to kind of keep telling new team members, like don't take, don't just presume someone's really angry and fed up about yeah. it. it. Might just be that that's the, you know, they're trying to answer you in the best way possible. And they've and yeah, and I also love the fact that when we're working with these people from around the world, they've just got different ways of working and, and different steps and cultures and stuff like that. And actually, sometimes you go to it and you go, "Why are we not doing that? That just works." Yeah. And there's certain bits then you can just kind of adopt and you go, "Oh, it just makes sense. Why are we? Not, why?" And you just pick bits and pieces up, and then yeah, it's it's ridiculous and then yeah absolutely and you get different cultures go okay great and it's like working with Japanese people it's all about respect and there's no and you can tell them like I've apologized to a Japanese company for me doing something wrong and causing them a problem and they they end up apologizing to me because they think it's that that they've made the mistake that I think their show ran over but I was like look it's my fault that you went up late because we had this other Mm. problem but they were like, no, no, we ran over. It's our problem. I'm like, no, 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 it's but like it's got nothing to do with you, but would not accept my apology. It was all, and I was like, and I think it just ended up that I ended up buying them a beer. And it was like, look, it's I explained to it, but it was just, and it's always one of those, and it is amazing work with such variety of things that, and then yeah, adds that little bit of an extra challenge in the kind of 
planning process yeah. and then just the time difference does make that a bit interesting it does and you, but you just learn so much as you say you learn better ways of doing things you'd never have you know I, I've never really done anything other than theatre it's like all I've ever done and uh, probably because I'd be rubbish at anything else but um but you kind of uh, so you you feel fairly confident in in the way that we do things in the UK but you, you move anywhere else in the world and everywhere has a slightly different way of doing it and often it's better and and it's actually like one of the great joys I think of the Edinburgh Festival is the fact that it is this melting pot of ideas not just like theoretical and intellectual ideas which obviously it is and that's really fascinating but also just practical ideas on the best way to do things and that mm. that's that's definitely one of the great joys of being involved in it I think yeah absolutely and just yeah you just I think it was I think the last certainly the last two fringes that have actually happened um like it's people from every continent everything like that and even just down to just general kind of language and chat and what they will call something what we call something can you kind of you're just learning little bits and pieces all the time and do that I think we had a Welsh theatre company come in and do some bits and they they say do all their calls in English first and then in Welsh and I'm like and I, the first time I heard it I was like what what's going on because I only heard the Welsh part and then they explained oh no no we do everything's in both I was like oh. and so even with the UK there's just little things that you kind of pick up on and learn and stuff like that and yeah it's it's I mean you know it's what and I think it's kind of that's what makes the festival quite unique is that it is so international in yeah. in nature it really is and it and and so international and everyone's there at the same time so you get this amazing kind of spread and yeah every day is different and it's it's uh, yeah it's definitely what keeps me coming back I think yeah absolutely it's and like I said it's yes we return back and it's the same spaces and venues predominantly every year but you can have a complete but it's a completely different set of 15 20 shows that are using that space and they all each one of them uses it completely differently everyone always kind of goes oh we're just trying to do this can you do this and just tweak this and yeah there's always something new and different about it and you just kind of go yep yeah, fun let's just make it happen it's i do that it's yeah very very rare that you all go no there's no way that can happen but yeah I mean, anyway, not really to say that very often you just have to find your way around the problem don't you yeah there's always solutions so um so moving on a little bit obviously we've had a very strange year with no fringe in 2020 and the yeah. different uh things from that um you obviously launched zoo tv as a kind of alternative to that um so how did that kind of come about and the kind of idea for you behind that um i that was about there was a there was a as you probably would have guessed there was a there was a big meeting on on zoom of course of all the fringe venues and the fringe society and it was sort of decided that it was time to pull the plug as it were yeah and it was one of the weirdest, quietest, kind of saddest feeling days, I think. We all knew it was coming, but it's just, you know, when that's finally, when you finally say, that's it. That's it. And there was this kind of flurry of activity we had, I think, two days before it went public. And we obviously needed to contact our shows and our staff. And there was a lot of stuff we needed to do. And we did that quite quickly. And then about three or four hours later, it was kind of all the admin was done and the emails were sent. And I was just sat at my desk thinking well what do I do now and and it's kind of weird because suddenly you're there's a, this huge hole in your year yeah um and uh I just thought I wonder if we could do something online and I I genuinely I just started to build a website and I'm rubbish you know I really don't know <laughs> what I'm doing I I am not yeah. a web builder in any sense of the word um and I just it was like really rough and I and I think I just did it as a distraction because I was just feeling a bit miserable and a bit fed up and I just I just put some video boxes on a web page and like stuck some YouTube content in them and saved it and then forgot about it for three weeks oh and I stuck a little thing saying Zoo TV at the top but it was just like an idea and it, it, yeah. I, I thought it would probably like many of my ideas <laughs> half finished and that. never get <laughs> never get done <laughs> um like you know every bit of DIY and all that stuff that you know if it runs finishing but um yeah and then I yeah and then there was sort of like this weird period where we had to you know uh, get money back for people pay people money you mm. sort all the logistics out and we were quite busy for a couple of weeks 
And then we got to the, and then that kind of passed. And I thought, oh, I've got this idea. I wonder if it could work. So I did a little, I went back and I did a little bit more work on the site. And I still didn't know if anyone wanted to be on it. Um, and then I chatted to the rest of the team and I said, look, you know, we were having, we, we do this thing. We all, you know, because we couldn't see each other and everyone was feeling miserable. So we'd play um, online poker together um, very late at night. Yeah. Uh, which is a bit of a zoo thing. We like playing poker. And um, and we and I chatted to them and they all went, well, it's, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. So what we did is we, we drew up a list. We said, we'll just start from scratch. And so we, we drew up a list between us of who over the past 20 years, because that would have been our 20th anniversary. Mm. So who over the past 20 years do we really love? Like which of the shows that we've, that have really gripped us or that we think might have something. And we made a list and I just started emailing and calling them and saying, look, uh, we're thinking of doing something online. It's all going to be for free. We're not going to get into ticketing or any of that mess. We've got no money to pay you. We'd love to, but there's there's zero money. Um, are you interested? And the response was just brilliant. You know, it was like almost overwhelmingly people were coming back saying, actually, I have got an idea. Um, you know, some people straight away, like National Dance Company of Wales, like I think it took them about 26 minutes to respond with, yes, absolutely, we've got this piece of dance that was done for film that's not that's sitting in the yeah, archive yeah. not used that'd be great and that was like an immediate thing and that kind of gave me the confidence okay people are interested um but we also chatted to a lot of people you know about doing some stuff live because that kind of intrigued us and again we didn't really know how we were going to do it technically I'm certainly no video expert I don't think any of the team really are that's not what we do we do live you know but we had yeah, some yeah. repurpose our brains a bit so yeah, so in the end, we ended up uh, basically fast forward. We ended up with thirty events. Some of it was pre-records of shows. Some of it was live streams <coughs> we designed just for Zoo TV. Uh, we ran it for a week. Um, we changed the program every day. Um, it was yeah, it all broke at about half past midnight on the night before we were meant to go live it was all working yeah. it was great uh and and then it all broke as these things always do and there was a sort of panic to make it work in time for it launching yeah. uh but yeah i mean in in the end it was more successful than i think we knew it would be we kind of had very low expectations um but um the analytics tell us 33,000 people watch shows. So yeah, in the exactly. end, it's just like... <laughs> yeah, you can't... Yeah, that speaks for itself, really, doesn't it, in that sense that yeah. it's well... And especially, I think it was, like I said, it was a really great thing to do. And then, yeah, just reaching out to people. Because I think a lot of people had... There was that lovely moment in first lockdown where just this... Everyone who had something filmed, recorded in their archives just appeared online and the, yeah. and the world was just flooded with theatre and stuff online or stuff that you if you never got the chance to see it live suddenly reappears there was obviously bits from the national with certain famous people in it that you're like oh the only that reappeared and you're like oh it's really great but yeah the, i bet thing there were always are a lot of companies that just had something sat there that they'd created yeah. and never knew what to do with so um yeah zoo tv certainly filled the gap and i think it was great that it did as well for as well for you guys and at least there was something for your 20th anniversary if not quite what was originally planned it certainly it certainly filled a if it if it did nothing it filled a gap in our year you know just from our mental yeah actually the team just having something to do i think was probably worth its weight in gold you know we were um it, yeah it was and also it's i think it just to give those artists like a platform which is always the purpose of what we do so to be able to offer that was quite interesting and you know and we did some you know like we did rehearse readings of brand new plays like things we wouldn't normally do you know things that wouldn't normally work in Edinburgh so yeah it just gives you some freedom to yeah but for, and I always. think I've talked haven't talked to a lot of people as well who've done online things they have suddenly find they're reaching people that would never have normally even considered it or seen it or even watched it I think I talked to Olga Theatre from London and they were saying some of their like online offering for children they're getting people from Italy going when's the next one coming in like and normally they're 
in terms of that, they're obviously UK based and centric and London in that sense. So they're only going to get a UK market, but suddenly they've got, and now they're going forward, they're going, oh, well, it's something we're going to keep doing because we've got this reach that's going so much further than it they ever thought that normally it would have done because they would have never, or they had thought about doing online things, but never really kind of got to the point of doing it because the, the actual live theatre always took precedent, really. Yeah, I d- yeah, absolutely. And it, I love the international aspect of it. I mean, um, it, there's that lovely thing in, you, in the analytics and you can look where in the world. <laughs> you're like, oh, three people from Eritrea have watched yeah. <laughs> a video. And you're like, I'm fairly certain that those people are probably not likely to have ever come to the Edinburgh Festival. Yeah. Um, and uh, that that's like kind of is exciting that you can reach a, a wider audience and, and also reach, you know, uh, reach an audience that perhaps are, are excluded from traditional venues, in particular fringe venues with their staircases and they're built in places that aren't particularly accessible, you know, and that feel excluded from it. So actually it was a way of, it, it's, it's, I think it does open more, more doors than, you at first think it will be absolutely so do you think zoo tv is something that you'll look to carry on in addition to zoo or that will run in conjunction or i we're we're planning to do it this year i think i think we'll probably change how we did it i think there's a there's a need to there's certainly need to look at ticketed shows because artists need to make some money um and you can't and it's really interesting. There's been a real shift. I think when in the first lockdown, as you say, there was all this stuff for free and, and the national kind of led the way. Yeah. And then slowly over the course of the year, the national went behind a paywall and then everything else followed. And now there's actually really interesting, innovative live stream. So the playhouse had one this weekend that looked really good. Mm. Um, uh you know people are using spaces and live streaming shows and making it more of an event so i think i think the it feels to me that the that what's happening is people are transitioning from showing archival stuff to like creating new stuff for the platform yeah so yeah certainly we we want to carry on doing it certainly this year um and just seeing how we can kind of make it still relevant mm. um and i guess we'd run it i guess I mean, obviously, we don't know about live at the minute, but um, I guess we'd, I guess hy- hybrid events that are both live and streamed is as of interest. Um, yeah, kind of and merge the two together to kind of, like we've just touched on, that extended reach to people that might not be able to get to it in person or... Yeah. For and and how we... And that, there's a really interesting thing, isn't there, around, like, uh, the work that is produced online making sure that it really fits the medium because I, I think some work doesn't you know a, an iPhone at the back of a room filming a show is never really going to be that fascinating to watch yeah unless it's designed to work on that and obviously there is ways that that could be designed to work but I think so I, I think it's also really interesting to see what companies are coming up with and, and and how they're shifting into the digital world and some have decided not to do it and I think that's I think that's really brave and probably quite sensible. Like if they don't feel that they've got anything to to give to it, then stick. But I think others have, have done some really interesting work. And um, so, yeah, so our programme this year, we're sort of, we're at the very early stages of planning, but we're talking to people about how we could best do things and how we can work together on it. Um, and then, and then I guess, you know, we'll wait and see on live. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that point we're all at is kind of, there's lots of options it's just quite which ones can and can't happen and finding that best balance between the two and I think it's something in the future I think everyone we've all realized the potential for what online is but I think you touched on it just then quite rightly that if you're going to start putting things online it needs to be created and aimed to be online because there's one thing being in the room when it's happening and I feel an atmosphere but then just having a static camera at the back taking a wide shot just isn't gonna yeah it's not gonna cut it is it there's that thing isn't there about um yeah I mean I I think we're all desperate to get back to that shared experience of being in a room with other people and I and I think I think digital can add a lot but 
I think our instincts as theatre makers is always to be in a room with other people. Because if not, we'd be in the movies, right? Surely. Yeah, absolutely. We'd all be doing that. <laughs> surely, already, we'd yeah. be, surely we'd all be in telly and film if, if we'd and rather film. control it. Uh, yeah, I've done a few days working TV and film and I, and I can't, I just, it can be live, but I still don't, I don't know why. I just don't enjoy it as much yet. Everyone goes, oh, but you do theatre live. And I'm like, but, and I can't tell you why. Like, yeah, you can work on live TV, but for some reason it feels very different. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, likewise. I think it's just that thing, isn't there, when you're in a room with like a hundred other people and you're all watching a show and there's this, there's a real sense of nervousness because then literally anything could happen. Yeah, and absolutely. the audience could react in a different way and the performers could do things in a different way. And the, and if you're in Edinburgh, the power will probably fail halfway through. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. <laughs> or the roof might fall in or any Far of the other... Your control. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a weird one. And I mean, I was out on tour and what's happened and we filmed uh, the show that I was with and it was for cinema and TV and stuff. And I can remember doing them and I was like, and it just felt very different. I think there was a somewhat added pressure that we're like, we've got to get this kind of right. Like it's got to be bang on. And I know the cast certainly kind of felt a bit different because they were like, well, we're, we've got a camera that's like up close. Like it's not, there's not that slight distance there's a camera that's zoomed into us so we've got to make so yeah that was very very interesting and I remember just little bits and pieces about it being very very different and just again we touched on a different way of working and there was a lot of things that we had to suddenly do differently but yeah it's a weird one when you've suddenly got cameras around and you're like oh, okay yeah and I don't know why I don't know why do it live to a few thousand people six times a week but stick a few cameras in and suddenly we're all feel a completely different set of pressure and yeah it's, a, it's just a different world isn't it I've, I think there's you know I think we've got to kind of be positive about the yeah. about what might come out of it um and I'm trying to be positive is I mean obviously like like everyone I'm probably on that roller coaster of you know some days it feels really super positive and other days it feels bleak beyond all belief mm. but um you know yeah, I think there definitely will be some positives to come out of it all. And I think there kind of has to be. I think it's if we were to sit for a year and then and everything still be exactly the same as it was when we went into it, I think it would be kind of, well, to that, I think there's definitely got to be, we can make some positives and some changes and stuff to come from it that actually benefits everyone. And you go, yeah, well, actually, we can do this. We can do that. We can make things more accessible, changing things, how certain bits of work are done and what we offer. I think it's definitely some positives to come out of it and if anything I've just said it's been a bit of an enforced break <laughs> yeah I mean it's been an enforced break and I think it's I guess I, I'm kind of hopeful that when we are getting back to it like you know we can be quite a miserable lot can't we in the third world like we could like in a slightly joking way but we can slightly be a bit like oh we all like to be tired <laughs> oh I've got to get back to work and oh, I've had a 14 hour day and and yeah. And now I think maybe we might all go back going, oh, please, a 14 hour day in a theatre with other people or in a field or wherever we happen to be doing it. You know, find just myself craving of... an overnight get out, loading trucks in, the rain <laughs> at, in Bristol, like, like yeah. moaned about it at the time and was freezing cold and that. But now I'm like, yeah, I quite happily go back and do it. I did a show in them. Um, I did do a show this year, actually, in a field. Nice. Uh, and, uh, it was uh, in like November when we were allowed, or was it October? Mm. When, when we were sort of allowed to do social sort of allowed to do stuff, outside. yeah. And uh, it was, you know, it was absolutely freezing. I, like, I couldn't feel my, I was trying to like plug stuff up and like, you know, and uh, I was freezing, but everyone was so happy. It's like yeah. the happiest anyone's been to be cold. It's like, it may be freezing cold, but we're doing a show and it's outdoors and it's, lovely and yeah absolutely. You know, uh yeah but it, it yeah so it was it, yeah a joyous I, but I, I i suspect that if i'd been doing that gig two years ago i might have been going oh it's a bit chilly to be outside and <laughs> Well, 
Well, let's jump into kind of what is the final part of our podcast. Everyone gets asked the same sort of three questions when they come on, uh, and it's just a bit random, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you had a dream show that you could work on, produce, be a part of, or whether there's one thing you wish you could offer, what would that be? So this was a tough one. I thought about this for ages, and I thought, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think I kind of went historical, and I was like, if I could have been anywhere... I think I'd have really loved to have been like involved in like Woodstock and like those big early festivals. Cause like my way into the industry was doing like rock and roll festivals, Mm. like as a teenager, like tagging along with a local PA crew and being probably really annoying, but like desperate to help out. And there's something about being in a muddy field, setting up, you know, setting up a gig. Yeah. Just brilliant. And I, I reckon that, like, at the sort of birth of those big festivals, I think, like, Isle of Wight would stop. That, that would have been really cool. Like, because it had yeah, never that, been done before, you know? It's yeah, like, back in those scale. really early days, yeah. And, yeah. like, you can imagine what a nightmare it would have been, but also how cool. <laughs> yeah, at the same time, like, look after afterwards and you go, yeah. We, or it would probably be, like, 20 years later when you look at it and what it became and you're like, oh, yeah, I was involved in the that. first one yeah I think that would have been really ace <laughs> yeah I could yeah that would have been a right laugh um second question um your go-to post-show snack or post shift well it's got to feature crisps because they're like the best thing in the world but yeah. my, my my go-to in tech rehearsals at the end of shifts is always a cheese and crisp sandwich cheese butty with crisps in it like nice yeah can't go wrong best (laughs) probably at like 4am from scott mid you know but uh when it is mix and match yeah exactly absolutely yeah no cooking involved just quick and easy yeah um so final question um what's the one thing that you know now that you wish you'd known when you were first starting out, that probably would have made your life an awful lot easier. Funnily enough, in contradiction to everything I've said, <laughs> it's <laughs> learning learning that it's all right to say no sometimes. But I kind of mean to like job offers and stuff. Mm. But I, I think when you start out, quite rightly, you say yes to everything um, because you do, and you want to just get experience. And I think that's great for a while. But I think there comes this point where you, everyone learns it, where you've got to start actually turning things down is sometimes the right thing to do and i'm rubbish but just yeah me too. <laughs> <laughs> so terrible <laughs> sometimes me too. i just think you knew this was a bad idea and yet you just said yes you said yes or you just say yes to everything and you find that you've got far too much going on and you can't yeah. do what you want to really do for badly. everything you've got on the diary is just too full but yeah so i think i think just that i think like i I still think you should try and say yes to as many things as possible, but I did, there are times you should say no. And I don't, it, it took me a long time to figure that out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mate, well, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up and chatting away. It's been, been great. great. Thank you for listening to the stage is yours podcast. Want to know more? Then head over to all of our socials. You can find us at Stage Is Yours Pod, where you can catch a cheeky glimpse at some of our upcoming guests. And subscribe to our YouTube channel to make sure that you never miss an episode. This has been the Stage Is Yours Podcast, talking all things theatre and events. Until next time.